so maybe let me repeat just the, um, the announcements that if you want to ask a question to the audience, please post it in the chat and uh, anyone in the audience can answer your question without having to interrupt the speaker. And if you want to ask a question to the speaker, raise your hand and either the speaker or me will, will give you the opportunity to ask the question. So without uh, further waiting, let me introduce uh, Sir Professor Simon Donaldson, who is um, speaking from London and is going to tell us about um, calibrated geometry and gauge theory for manifolds of special holonomy. And so Simon, uh, please, the floor is yours or the screen. Well, thank you to the organizers for um, inviting me to give this opening talk in this um, important meeting, one of a long series of string math meetings. Um, this, uh, I hope, will be mostly a talk of a sort of a survey nature. Um, the, the majority of things I'll be saying will be um, pretty well known to people who are specialists in the field. Uh, so, what do we do? <clears throat> Let's just recall background. <clears throat> the um, <clears throat> we start in Romanian geometry with uh, the notion of the holonomy group of a, of a Romanian manifold, which is um, the group of orthogonal transformations of the tangent space that you get by parallel transporting tangent vectors around loops. So you fix a base point, transport a tangent vector at that base point around a loop, come back, it'll be rotated by a certain amount in general, and um, taking all those rotations, you get a subgroup of the orthogonal, uh, the group of orthogonal transformations. Then there are famous lists, going back to Berger, of what groups um, are possible. <clears throat> uh, and um, there are some standard families, for example, Kähler manifolds, where you have the, the unitary group uh, inside the orthogonal group. Uh, but then there are two exceptional cases, um, one in dimension 7, with the exceptional Lie group G2, and another one in um, dimension 8, where there's a subgroup um, spin 7, the double cover of SO7, uh, can be regarded as a subgroup of the orthogonal transformations in 8 dimensions. And in fact, uh, <clears throat> Also going down to six dimensions, the case SU3, which from one point of view fits into the whole family of um, what called Calabi R metrics, SUN, uh, that is, uh, the case N equals three has some special features uh, related to the seven and eight dimensional things we mentioned, and so also could be thought of as an exceptional case in some ways. So these manifolds, uh, are interesting in many ways. They're very special kinds of uh, Romanian manifolds. Um, they have zero Ricci curvature. And um, the, these structures, this reduction of the holonomy to this subgroup, can be characterized in various ways. One, um, which is important in terms of supersymmetry, I believe, is the existence of parallel spinner fields. Uh, a, a, another variant is to consider parallel differential forms, which characterize these structures. So in, in the um, going down, starting in eight dimensions, then the relevant form is a, a certain kind of four form. Uh, in the seven dimensional case of G2, then uh, we have a three form, but we can also take its star to get a four form. And then in SU3, we have um, the, the metric form, as usual, on, on a Kähler manifold, and also a, a holomorphic three form, a complex three form. Well, we won't go into details, but these, these forms, these differential forms, are required to be compatible algebraically with the metric structure in the appropriate ways in the different cases. For example, in the seven-dimensional case of G2, the four-form, in fact, one can recover the metric from the, sorry, the three-form, phi, 
by this construction, well, this construction gives you that up to scale, more precisely, that if you take your three form, contract it with a tangent vector, that gives you a two form, take the square of that to get a four form, and the wedge product with phi, uh, that gives you a, a seven form, the volume element, so up, up to a choice of a volume form, this defines a quadratic form, which is required to be the, um, the Euclidean structure, the Riemannian structure. But these differential forms, um, these special structures, yield um, interesting kind of geometric objects which we can study inside these manifolds. Um, first, we're going to talk about submanifolds, uh, where these, these differential forms give what are called calibrated geometries in the sense of Harvey and Lawson. So let's just review briefly how that goes. Uh, for example, in the eight-dimensional case, if we, if we fix a point in our manifold, then if we look at a four-dimensional subspace inside the tangent space, we compare the volume form defined by the Riemannian metric on this subspace with the restriction of the four-form omega at that point to the subspace. And um, for the forms of the kind we're considering, one has the basic calibration property that the volume uh, dominates the pairing with omega and equality occurs on an interesting special set, a 12-dimensional set of what are called Cayley four planes within the Grassmann manifold of all four planes in the tangent space. So the special structure given by this four form selects this uh, particular space of special four dimensional planes in the tangent space at each point. So then that leads to a corresponding notion for submanifolds. A oriented four dimensional submanifold is called a Cayley submanifold if at each point its tangent space is one of these special four-dimensional vector subspaces. But then we have the basic sort of calibration inequality. That's to say, um, if we have any other submanifold, say X primed, in the same homology class as our Cayley submanifold X, then by the, the inequality we wrote down before, applied at each point and then integrated over the manifold, the volume of x primed is at least equal to the integral of omega over x primed. On the other hand, omega is a, uh, a parallel form with respect to the levi civita connection, so it's certainly a closed form. And since x primed is in the same homology class as x, that means the integral over x of omega is the same as the integral over x primed. On the other hand, for x, that, the, by hypothesis, that is where equality holds, so this integral gives exactly the volume. So this, this says that for any submanifold in the same homology class, the volume is at least the volume of the, uh, the Cayley submanifold. The Cayley submanifold is a minimal submanifold, and it's absolutely volume minimizing within its homology class. And exactly the same thing applies in um, other cases in uh, these geometries we're considering. In the, in the seven-dimensional case, one has a class of special three-dimensional submanifolds called associative submanifolds, which um, <coughs> we'd have exactly the same discussion, but using the three-form phi in place of omega that we had before. Uh, and similarly, there is also a, a four-dimensional, class of four-dimensional submanifolds, co-associative, uh, where star phi plays the same role. In the six-dimensional case, again, we have holomorphic curves, which uh, omega plays the same role, it's quite 
familiar in complex geometry, this identity. And then we also have what are called special Lagrangian submanifolds, where uh, the real part of the, the, the complex free form theta um, is what's called the calibrating form. So in all of these geometries consider we're considering, we have some interesting special class of submanifolds uh, to study. Um, <clears throat> they're all minimal submanifolds, and they also have elliptic deformation theories by basic work of McLean from quite a while ago. And so that leads to the fact that one has finite dimensional moduli spaces of these um, Submanifolds. The other kind of um, geometry we want to think about <clears throat> on one of these manifolds, the special holonomy, um, are the um, these gauge theories. So there are special instance on solutions of the Yang Mills equations. So now we're considering a, the usual kind of setup. We're considering a, an auxiliary bundle E over our manifold and a connection on that, which will have a curvature, which is a, a bundle valued two form, a section of the, the lambda two, the exterior square of the cotangent bundle, tensored with uh, the bundle of Lie algebras associated to E. So we can think of, at a point in our manifold, we can think of the, the fiber of this bundle lambda 2 as the Lie algebra of the group of orthogonal transformations of the tangent bundle. Basically just the, the Lie algebra of the orthogonal group is the space of skew symmetric matrices. On the other hand, in our situation, we have this holonomy group, which is supposed to be some proper subgroup of the orthogonal group. So that we take the Lie algebra of that, uh, is it, we, okay, so we get a subbundle of lambda two corresponding to the Lie algebra of the holonomy group G. So the, we, in, in all of these cases, uh, we can say that we have an instanton connection if the curvature lies inside this subbundle lambda to g, uh, tensored with the same adjoint bundle. And there's a misprint here that this p here should be e to fit in with what we had before. And in, in the different cases, we can write that definition down in various other ways. So this is very analogous to the, the submanifold discussion. We have a, um, using chern weil theory, we get um, uh, sort of an analogous uh, inequality involving the Yang-Mills energy and relating that to characteristic classes of our bundle. In particular, these instantons minimize the Yang-Mills energy, the, the L2 norm of the curvature, uh, um, among all connections on a, on a given topological bundle. We also have elliptic equations. Uh, these, 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 these equations are elliptic, uh, modulo gauge. And uh, so again, one gets, roughly speaking, finite dimensional moduli spaces of solutions. In the case of, if you think of the six dimensional case, when G is SU3, then our recipe in that case just produces what are called Hermitian Yang Mills connections on holomorphic bundles, which um, this by well known results of Eulenbeck and Yao correspond to stable holomorphic bundles. So again, just like um, the holomorphic curves we were talking about in the, um, the submanifold discussion, these are things which can be studied through algebraic geometry, if our manifold is an algebraic variety. Uh, similarly, these um, these instantons in the SU3 case uh, can be studied through algebraic geometry. So 
So the question is, what do we, if we have all these interesting objects, what should we do with them? Well, one thing, I suppose, would be to say, do we really have any? I mean, proving the existence of any of these things is a, um, a non-trivial uh, thing. Uh, but even proving the existence of any of these manifolds with exceptional holonomy that we're talking about is a non-trivial thing. And um, one could, like we could devote sort of a good part of the talk to that. But instead, well, we'll take and we'll emphasize another direction in this talk, which is to consider a kind of a long standing idea, what might one think more of a, a pipe dream, one might say, is to, to, to try to find suitable deformation invariants of our structure by counting these differential geometric objects, either the instantons or the calibrated submanifolds. They're counting in a, in a suitable sense, which we'll talk about. Uh, in, in, a, in the same way, this is, this is counting is meant in the same way as is um, done <clears throat> very successfully in the case of things like gromov britten invariants, instanton invariants of four manifolds, cyber britten invariants, and so on. So let's, just to fix ideas somewhat, let's focus on the case of associative submanifolds in uh, G2 manifolds and instantons over G2 manifolds. Uh, and another interesting feature then, uh, which is again a common feature of the two cases, is that they both arise as critical points of locally defined functionals, or that's better to say they arise as zeros of closed one forms on the infinite dimensional spaces of all submanifolds or all connections. So in the, um, just again, so see how this goes roughly in the submanifold case. Um, if, we, if we fix some submanifold y0, and um, so we're doing a local discussion to begin with, so we'll consider y in the same homology class as y0 and also close to it in some way. So then if we have any such y, we can choose a w, which is a four chain, which gives a homology between y and y0. So essentially w could be a a four-dimensional submanifold with boundary uh, the, the union of y and y0 um, and the appropriate orientations. Then we're going to define our functional at y by taking the integral over w of the four form of star phi. And since star phi is closed, that means that if we make a different choice of w in the same relative homology class, then um, we get the same integral. So we get, at least for submanifolds close to um, y naught, we get a well-defined functional f. <clears throat> and certainly its derivative, as I said, is a well-defined one form on the infinite dimensional space, or I could go up to some kind of cover, it makes some kind of covering construction to get a well-defined functional. So in the gauge theory case, there's a, again a very analogous discussion involving um, Chern-Simons theory. We take the, speaking, the wedge product of the Chern-Simons three form with star phi and integrate over the seven manifold. So that puts us in a, at least in a kind of a formal picture, which is um, in a sense familiar of these kind of functionals. Uh, the same kind of things ar as arise in other theories, such as Fleur homology theory over uh, three manifolds, or in Fleur homology theory in symplectic topology. We would like, the, the appropriate thing we would like to do, roughly, would be to count the solutions with, with, with signs, uh, and then uh, interpret that as 
the Euler characteristic of the infinite dimensional ambient space of all submanifolds or all connections. Uh, and we could also imagine going further to define Fleur type theories with Fleur homology groups defined by setting up a complex and counting uh, solutions of the corresponding equations on the cylinder, m times r, to define the differentials of that complex. And at a, a sort of a formal level, all of these things can, roughly speaking, be done. But I don't really want to talk about that too much in the talk, because the, the really fundamental difficulty in doing this is uh, the problem of understanding the compactness of the set of solutions of our equations, or that's better, the possible failure of compactness. So imagine we're, you know, we're trying to count our uh, solutions of uh, one of these equations, uh, but what we want is a deformation invariant. We want, if we deform our G2 structure in our uh, in a one parameter family, we want our count not to change. Perhaps, perhaps one should just say that these, uh, these structures, for example, these G2 structures, uh, arise in huge moduli spaces, typically. So we do, uh, we do many actual cases encounter these big families of G2 structures, not just a single one. So the, the, the problem is that we could have some finite set of solutions, say at the, the beginning of our, the first point in our one parameter family, but as we move in the family, we could, uh, our count could change because a, a solution develops singularities and disappears, or this is a <clears throat> sort of a time symmetric discussion, um, reversing it, we could, we could encounter a singular object and then a new solution is born out of that singular object. So this is just a picture to illustrate that. So I'm, I'm in this picture, the bottom axis is supposed to represent the um, our, our parameter in our one parameter family of G2 structures. The vertical axis is supposed to represent schematically the space of all objects, all sub-manifolds, or all uh, connections. And then these, this, uh, these paths are supposed to represent the solutions. So at our original time, we have a nice finite set of solutions that we could count. And then as we move along, various things could happen. And one, one thing that could happen is we could have a picture like this, where two solutions come together emerge, perfectly good smooth solutions of our equation, merge and then disappear. But that's very familiar, just the same thing happens in ordinary differential topology. We know that we should either count modulo 2, in which case that won't, we're losing two things, so that won't matter, or we should discuss orientations, in which case one of this will come with a plus one sign, the other with a minus one sign, so the overall count won't change. But the real difficulty is something else, that we might have this family of smooth solutions that we move along, but then it moves off and doesn't converge within the space of smooth solutions. Possibly it converges to some kind of singular object at this critical time, but then uh, say we can't deform that any further away. So when we've gone to the final part of our family, we've had an overall change in our, our count. So this is the essential thing that I want to really talk about in the, um, the rest of the talk. And so as I said, it's quite, um, it's definitely not at all clear that one ultimately can um, define some uh, useful deformation invariants using this um, 
following this program, but whether or not that can be done, the study of these kind of compactness questions leads to a lot of interesting geometry and analysis. Um, and there has been a lot of progress in that direction of, in the last few years through work of many people. I'll, I'll be mentioning uh, some names. I hope I don't omit to mention too many names that I ought to. Uh, so I think we, we can say we understand a lot more now than we did 10 years ago so. But there are many things that remain either to be understood in the sense of having an understanding of what ought to happen, or where things that are perhaps in a sense understood what ought to happen um, is a different thing to prove rigorously that that is the case. Perhaps we could say in the case again of holonomy SU3, like when we're talking about Calabi Yau threefolds, then there are rigorous theories uh, developed in the, the algebraic geometric framework, taking an entirely algebraic geometric point of view, going back to uh, the work of Richard Thomas. Um, yes, so, but of course, in, in the other cases, we don't have the sort of reduction to algebraic geometry available. And uh, there are many interesting questions about relating the algebraic geometry constructions to more differential geometric point of view. And I think maybe maybe the talk of Thomas Walfuski will um, be talking about, I think, enumerative invariants of Calabi out threefolds um, will be <clears throat> somewhat connected to what we're saying. So we're going to talk about um, two aspects of this sort of many faceted, faceted question about these compactness questions. Um, so there is certainly not, these are not the only two aspects, and we won't have time to say anything like all that will be required to give a, um, a, thorough, a thorough account of, of even these two. So we just want to give two, we sort of give us some sort of Sort of flavour of what goes on. So the first will be what's called the bubbling of instantons, and the second topic will be talking about singularities of associative submanifolds. So let's let's begin then the bubbling of instantons. So we want to consider uh, an instanton connection over um, so it's an n-dimensional manifold M. Then there's a basic it's so an analytical fact of um, proved by Eulenbeck and Nakajima separately back in the 1980s, which is that if you have a ball in the manifold on which the connection has got a small normalized energy, then you get essentially complete control of the connection. So the normalized energy means we, we take the integral of the, the square of the norm of the curvature over this ball but then we divide by this dimension-dependent factor. If the dimension was um, 4, then this factor would disappear, and that um, reflects the scale invariance of Yang-Mills theory in four dimensions. So the statement is that if this, if this, if this normalized energy is less than some sort of universal, essentially universal number epsilon, then at least on interior regions, say the ball of half the size, uh, you get estimates on all derivatives of the connection in a, in a suitable local gauge. In particular, if you have any sequence of such things uh, over this fixed ball, then you can take a subsequence which converges. So let's call a ball bad if it violates this condition, if it has quite a lot of energy um, compared with its size. So now supposing that on our manifold the, the, with the total energy, the integral of the L2 norm of the curvature is C, which as we said for instantons this will be a topological invariant, so we can suppose that we know what this is, then we make the following simple observation. 
supposing we have some collection of disjoint bad balls in our manifolds, then applying the inequality, applying the definition of a bad ball, and summing over the balls, we get the condition that the sum of the radii ri to the power n minus 4 is less than something to, determined by the constants involved. So in particular, you'll see the union of these balls must be quite a small set within the manifold. The, the whole vol the, the, the volume of these balls, the volume that will be given by the sum of ri to the n, which will be much smaller than the sum of ri to the n minus 4. So developing this idea by some straightforward analysis arguments, uh, <clears throat> one can show that if we have a sequence of such connections, then after taking a subsequence, we can find a they, we, we, they, they will converge outside a subset of the manifold of Hausdorff house co-dimension four or more. And uh, so this we, this will be true if we consider instantons with respect to a fixed structure or any sort of smooth bounded family of, as I said, G2 here, of, of structures of the kind we're considering. So in our, in our what that's saying, that in our um, discussion regarding counting instantons, if in fact in our family this set S never appeared, then we wouldn't encounter this kind of um, singular behavior and our counting project could proceed without any difficulty. Then this, um, the, the geometry of the situation, um, as, as was shown by Tian, shows that the, roughly speaking, the co-dimension for part, let's call it S naught of this singular set S, is an associative well, submanifold in a, in a certain generalized sense. It, it might not be exactly a submanifold, but it's a set which satisfies the associative, associative condition in a, a suitable generalized sense. But for our purposes, let's just think of it as an associative submanifold. So the picture is that if we look in a four dimensional subspace transverse to this associative submanifold, then what we see in our sequence of connections is modeled on the more familiar thing where one has a sequence of four dimensional instantons bubbling over a point. We could have done the whole preceding discussion in the case n equals four, but then we would conclude that our set S is just a finite set of points. The work of, of Hades and Galpuski and others gives a, a good understanding of um, when this, this bubbling phenomena can occur over a given associative submanifold in terms of the, ex the existence of a solution of a, a partial differential equation, a, it's called a footer equation, over the submanifold. And they proposed a counter term to alleviate this difficulty by counting not just the instantons, but instantons and also associative submanifolds, but the submanifolds are weighted by a count of a certain generalized Seibert-Witten equation over them. So the, 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 the basic idea is that as we move in our one parameter family, this count of solutions of the cyber witten equation might change, but it should do that in exactly the right way to match up with the change in the count of instantons. So this is a very beautiful idea and certainly resolves a lot of the uh, basic problems, but there are, uh, there are some essential difficulties uh, to do with the cases where one has reducible solutions to the these cyborg written equations. This occurs, for example, when the when the 
the topology of this three manifold S0 is relatively simple. So this is similar to the fact that in the ordinary cyborg Witten theory, um, that the story is different if you're uh, defining invariance of a homology three sphere from a manifold with large homology. So it's also interesting to consider um, what could be happening in higher co-dimensions, singular sets of instantons of, of higher co-dimension, uh, and also um, well, um, the, the, the way those singularities could develop and the limits of sequences of smooth connections. So again, in the Hermitian Yan Mills case, these things uh, roughly speaking, correspond to called reflexive sheaves in algebraic geometry, which are roughly speaking bundles with point singularities in the situation. And the whole picture is quite well understood through um, old work of Bando and Xu, uh, and more recently advances of uh, Xumao Chen and Song Sun on uh, understanding the differential geometry of Hermitian Yang Mills connections on these singular objects, these sheaves. Uh, Yankee Wang has results on co-dimension singularities in the G2 case, uh, which are sort of modeled in the transverse direction on this Hermitian Yang Mills picture. And another uh, interesting well, development and potential development in the future is that when combining this discussion with the, the co-dimension four bubbling discussion and the, the hades Walpuski proposal, I apologize for the misprint, then uh, these uh, discussion of these singularities here should be related to uh, work of Taubes and others on the kind of co-dimension two singularities that can appear as limits of generalized cyber Witten solutions over three-dimensional manifolds. So there's a, a very interesting uh, picture largely remaining to be worked out, relating all these um, right, re relatively recent developments in geometry and analysis. But let's go on to the last part in which I want to talk about purely within the associative submanifold story, what, what kind of singular phenomena are important. You see, if we um, just Stepping back a second, we maybe in the previous discussion we talked about we ought to count associative submanifolds as well as the instantons, but then we have other problems involved purely in the associative submanifold discussion. So there's a, an important conjecture of uh, Dominic Joyce in this field, which is that if you if you only ask about generic one parameter families of G2 structures, then there are only a limited number of singular phenomena that you need to worry about. So this is, I say it's a conjecture, but it's, as you see, it's, it's quite a lot of evidence for it. So one expects that if we allowed larger families, we, we, we talked about the general kind of singularity that could occur, that would be probably a very complicated story. Similar to if you talk about the general kind of singularity you can have in a complex algebraic variety is a very complicated story. But so if one can simplify the complicated story by asking what are you going to see in small, low-dimensional generic families, then that's important. So there are, there are, well, there are basically two phenomena we're going to talk about. The third one involving multiple covers, we won't actually, this is not so much understood. Again, may, might be related to Thomas Walpuski's talk somewhat, um, but this is just another direction that we won't actually say anything more about today. So there are, there are two phenomena. The third I'll call, which is a, let's say, the birth or death of solutions due to what I call Joyce Nordstrom crossing. And then the second one is the appearance of what I would call surgery triples arriving 
from smoothing of certain cone singularities, which would go back to Harvey and Lawson. So let me um, briefly explain what those things are. If we have a pair of associative submanifolds in, in our seven-dimensional manifold, then they will not typically intersect. They're three-dimensional things in a seven-dimensional ambient space, so we don't expect them to intersect. But in a one-parameter family, then we expect that they will do, in a sort of generic sense. And then this phenomena was that, as, as in a one-parameter family, if two associative submanifolds cross, then you will get a new one born with the topology of the connected sum, P1 connected sum P2, inside the ambient seven manifold in a very obvious way. Or of course, as we said before, it could be a new one is born or it could be one of these things dies. Uh, what about this um, surgery triples? So we say there's an explicit associative submanifold that one can write down, or a singular submanifold, which is a, a cone over a two-dimensional torus. And this has got three topologically distinct smoothings. So if you apply these, you get three different smooth three-dimensional manifolds. And the construction to go from one to the other is by what's called a, a Dane surgery, or a, a loop in the three-manifold. So this kind of surgery triple is something which is quite familiar in three-manifold topology. <clears throat> so the last thing I'm going to talk about then is some, not so recent now, but it's a joint work of myself with Chris Caduto, which um, from our point of view of this talk gives some evidence for this uh, Joyce con conjecture uh, by studying what you might always call a toy model um, or, uh, uh, which is related to adiabatic constructions. Uh, and I said there was some earlier work um, very much related of Panterp and Runeholt. So what we're going to do is consider a, a seven manifold which fibers over a three manifold with fibers which are four dimensional hyperkähler manifolds. So in each fiber there's a triple of two forms, omega one, omega two, or three, spanning a three-dimensional space of two forms. So uh, uh, an adiabatic G2 structure on M is given by, among other things, an identification of this space of two forms, H plus, with the tangent space of Q at each point. So if we're given such an identification, then um, we can concoct a three form on the total space. So here I'm going to be slightly vague. I'm going to gloss over important things that one should say. So that's to say if we, if we have our, our triple omega 1, omega 2, 3, that's a basis in H2+. plus. So our identification gives a frame in the tangent space, and then we get a dual frame in the cotangent space. And then we can write down a three form given by the sum of the wedges of the omegas with the dual frame eaters. And that's independent of the choice of frame. So in fact, we get a family of three forms by adding on a multiple of the volume form in the base. And we get, so we have a parameter lambda, which is thought of as large, a large parameter. So this thing will not be an exactly uh, defined a G2 structure, but it's, let's say it's a model for a collapsing family of G2 structures in which we have these very small hyperkähler fibers. There are more precise things one could say, but I'm not going to attempt to do that in the time available. So the simplest case is when Q, uh, so the three manifold is taken to be a Riemannian three manifold, and our fibers are what are called Eguchi Hansen manifolds. So these are ALE manifolds, they're topologically they're the cotangent bundle of the two sphere. So each, each one contains uh, a special two sphere inside it, a self intersection minus two. So we can integrate our omegas over this two sphere to get a map 
linear map from H plus to R, and under identification, that becomes a one form on Q. So what we require in this, in this, in this um, situation is that this is a, a harmonic one form in order for our forms phi lambda to be, in a sense, approximately G2 structures. And this is related to many other things, including um, work of Joyce and Kirigianis, who use this kind of construction. So now we can um, do the following. If we have a path in Q, in the base space, then we get a submanifold in M just by taking the union of these two spheres in the, in the, in the ALE space over each point. And then this submanifold is what we'll call an adiabatic solution of the associative condition if gamma is an integral curve of the vector field dual to this one form. We use the metric to turn the one form into a vector field. And then we can talk about integral curves. So I'm not going to, you could take this either as a definition of an adiabatic solution or there is some reason one could explain with more time why this condition is related to a certain limit of the uh, associative equations. Anyway, this is the picture that we have this path in the base, we have these two spheres in the fiber, we put them together to get a, a, a three-dimensional submanifold. Let us remark um, that counting integral curves of a vector field like this uh, just is a relatively well-known thing, or established thing, but this gives um, certain topological invariants of a three-manifold, and it's also written related to cyborg written flow homology when you promote things um, to one higher dimension. So to get to the main point, I think I just have just about time to do that. Um, so in this paper of Scaluto, as mentioning, we consider the case of uh, fibers which are K3 surfaces and also allowing singular fibers. But um, to explain the main point we want here, we would be simpler to consider the next case of the ALE uh, spaces, the ones of type A2. This is related to the work of Pantev and Greenholt I mentioned before, and also to work of um, Barbosa. So now the homology of the fiber is two-dimensional, and at least for generic choices in the moduli space of these X's, there are three two-spheres inside X, which are holomorphic with respect to different complex structures. And they satisfy one relation in homology, the sum is zero in homology. So now we get three vector fields on the base, just by playing the same construction as before, but, but, but their sum is zero, so any two determine the third one. And integral curves of any one of these three vector fields give these adiabatic associative submanifolds. More generally, we want to allow trivalent graphs made up of uh, segments of these integral curves that are allowed to meet at a point where three come together, uh, where the sum, of the, the sum of the tangent vectors is zero. So in this framework, one can see in analogues, in this sort of basically elementary discussion of considering families of gradient paths of this two phenomena that we talked about. So the joyce nordstrom crossing, it corresponds to this picture. Supposing at the beginning of our family, we consider these two integral curves, um, one for V1 and V2. Uh, the V1 and V2, in a sense, don't know anything about each other. So as we move in a family, these things can cross without any um, problem. So we can, after we go through a special time when these things cross, uh, we still have an equal curve of V2, an equal curve of V1. But we also get something different, which is given by this introducing these two trivalent vertices to get a configuration like this with of uh, an integral curve of V0 running between them. 
and one can check that the topology of the situation matches up with what we said before. Similarly, the surgery triple appears at a, 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 a sort of generic point in the moduli space of these ALE structures when um, rather than having th three two spheres, one of them degenerates into the union of the other two. So we have a, a reducible complex curve thought of from the complex geometry point of view. So in that case, these vector fields V1, V2, V0, V1, and V2 will all be multiples of one of another. So if we go through a time when such a thing appears on our integral curve, then we get this phenomena. But before, before that time, we're just seeing this, nice integral curve, V0. After that time, we're still seeing that, same sort of picture. But we see something else corresponding to the splitting of this trajectory into a, a little bit where we go either via V1 or V2 for a short time. So this is my last, so I, I'm just about to finish. Um, so this is um, an interesting, so this essentially well, elementary picture, but it gives some, to my mind, good evidence for the ultimate truth of Joyce's conjecture. And there are, as I said, many important and interesting things to be worked out. One of them is that to, to really establish this relation between these graphs and the, the associative submanifolds, an important step would be to prove the existence of what might call a plumbing piece, uh, which one could glue in at each of the, uh, the vertices of our graph. So one is led to conjecture the existence of a certain uh, non-compact um, associative submanifold in uh, X times R3, or in fact, one can reduce the question to a special Lagrangian in X times C, which is asymptotic in a certain sense to these three surfaces as we go to infinity. It has three ends asymptotic to these three surfaces. And there is some work of Saman Esfahani uh, towards that. Okay. So, thank you very much. I've slightly gone over time. Um, thank you for your listening. Well, thank you, Simon. Let's let's thank Simon for his talk. So, questions. Uh, So maybe I will start with one question. Um, so in this situation of the adiabatic limit, um, is it easier to try and consider the case of a Calabi-Aus threefold so that the base is two-dimensional, and maybe it's even possible to try and solve the Mongean-Pair equation in that case to try to get the actual metric, so not just being. Uh, I, I'm imagining a family of. Yes. I don't know. Um, no, uh, well, the whole discussion that one can do in the Calabi R case, and um, much more is known there. I mean, this, this work of Yang Li, for example, on describing the behavior of the, um, the asymptotics of, a, mm -hmm. of the Calabi R metric, when we have a, a K3 vibration and the, the fibers are collapsing. Um, another direction, this, this sort of enumerative picture I was talking about would be very much related to work of, for example, um, Ivan Smith and Tom Bridgeland on involving relation Foucault categories and quadratic differentials on Riemann surfaces. So the, rather than having those harmonic one forms, one would get quadratic differentials essentially on them, on your base Riemann surface in that case. So the answer is very much yes, that there's the, all of this. Okay. From another point of view, you might say it extends things that are better understood in that Calabi R situation. Another point okay, thank you. So I think next is Roman Gonin, who had this hand raised.
Okay, so if not now, then next is Edward Witten, if you can ask your question. Simon, uh, you said that the Instanton-like equation on a manifold of exceptional holonomy has it comes from a turn simons like action. Is that, I know that that's true in the G2 case, but is it actually true for spin seven manifolds? See, well, um, the, 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 the discussion there was just for the G2 case. I, oh, I, don't, I, I don't think there's anything like that in spin seven. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there other questions? Uh, Enrique Saharp, please go ahead. Hi, Simon. Um, so how much of this discussion would, would still make sense on a just merely co-closed uh, uh, setup? Right, so when, when the G2 structure has some torsion, it could still make sense of associative manifolds. Uh, and, and in the Chern Simons sort of formalism still, still holds. So, yes. how much of this would, would still make sense in, for more, more general G2 structures? So the, the problem is that the, the, to have this um, bound on the, the Young Mills energy, you need the closed condition or something. Some, some variant of it. Um, similarly, for the, to have the, the calibration bound on associated sub, the volume of associated submanifolds. So um, I'm not, I mean, it would be a bit like trying to define Gromov Witten invariants just for complex, or for general almost complex manifolds without a symplectic structure. But, um, so, and I, I think one sort of knows that that thing, something has to go wrong um, in, in an essential way if you do that. Uh, was the, the, the compactness has to fail in some essentially new way. I'm going back to the original work of Gromov. So, um, yeah, I'm, 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 not, I'm not, as you say, it's, the kind of a lot of the formal structure really involves the closed four form, the, the, but the the more analytical questions do seem to rely on the closed three form. Thank you. Uh, so next, Roman Gonin, you can un unmute yourself and ask the question, please. Well, no. Well, then, um, further questions? If not, we will now thank Simon again. And uh, let's do a, a short five minute break and then resume. <laughs>